Hello. Let's see if anybody joins this discussion. Um, let's also make sure it's in that Facebook group because every time, okay, we're good. We have to reset the Facebook connection. It's getting a little aggravating here. But welcome to the discussion of Nella Larson's passing. I have my copy that I have had since high school because I first read this in high school. Book is like over 20 years old now. And um, I've been listening to it on Audible. Get into it. So we're only doing one discussion this month on this book because it's such a short read. that I thought it would it just made sense to only do one discussion. We had initially thought about doing a screening of Passing, but honestly, when I watched Passing when it came out on Netflix, and I thought it was aggressively boring. <laughs> so like, did I want to make y'all sit through this discussion? Um, I just didn't think we would get a good engagement around watching Passing the movie together because of the way the movie was formatted. So... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're just going to do this little discussion. Um, audio input. Let's make sure the audio quality is giving. Friendly reminder, we have a fundraiser. I should add a little ticker across the bottom of the screen to just remind folks, I'm going to keep it up, that we need donations. And so the goal of the GoFundMe, we're trying to raise 80K by May 1st. The goal is really that the members of the book club share the GoFundMe with their broader networks. Because if you think about it, if we can get 80 people to donate $1,000, we'll meet our goal. If we can get uh, 160 people to donate $500, I think our goal is within range. But the idea isn't that the audience that we're currently speaking to donates is that that audience shares with their social networks because we really want to do more. Um, we want to improve the quality of these live discussions. We want to be able to put the cohort through training about doing live discussions. We want to do more interactive engagement around the readings because, you know, reading isn't accessible. We want to find more ways to meet the audience where they are and really get into this. Well, welcome to this discussion. Oh, I know somebody else with this last name. Myrta, is that how I say your name? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm assuming you're Haitian because I know another Haitian person with the same exact last name. So funny. So let's get into it. Uh, if you're new and you're watching this online after the stream, because for some reason you wanted more information on the book passing, you've read it on your own, you read it in the classroom, come on over to our brand new sbgbookclub.org website and join. Come on in. And then for everyone else, those of you who have been sharing our syllabi out with your classmates or your teachers, the teachers that have been using our syllabi in the classroom, you know, donate, help a hoe out, okay? Now, let's get, oh, where is my, um, my logo? I don't see a logo on here. That's so weird. Can I just drag it in here? No. That's so interesting. All right. Let's go ahead and get into this live discussion. Da -da -da. All right. So as I already stated, we are discussing passing by Noah Larson. This is very, very tasty. It is also um, a movie on Netflix. Uh, I don't know. I, I Tessa Thompson uh, narrates the audible version of Passing that I've been listening to. And I think she does a phenomenal job narrating the book. Um, when it comes to acting, you know? Yeah. I really like it. But, uh, I need that. But, um, yeah, it wasn't doing what it needs to say. 
mean, it wasn't a bad. It wasn't, you know what I mean? It wasn't bad. It just wasn't, hmm, I don't know. If anybody else has watched the Netflix special of Passing or the Netflix uh, film Passing, let me know. Uh, let me know what your thoughts were and we'll chat about it a little bit later on, okay? But as always, we are using the SBG Passing syllabus that I'm very excited to dig into here. It is on sale for $4.99 on the SPG book club website. So go ahead, grab it, start your own little, mm, not little, but you know, you can have your own communal book club. You can Definitely purchase our syllabi. That's the point of the syllabi. Is that's supposed to go into the community and help you facilitate your own conversations about the readings that we do. So get into it. Okay. Now, this syllabus was drafted by Dr. Nicole Carter. And Nella Larson herself had a very interesting upbringing. She grew up in Chicago to um, a white mother who was an immigrant from Denmark. So born in 1891, I think when we talk about like race, uh, we have to also, you know, set it in a time period because the way we talk about race now is not the way race was talked about in the 1890s. So someone being a Danish immigrant might not have yet been fully congealed into whiteness. Um, and she had a West Black West Indian father. And it's interesting now because I think if we imagine somebody who has like a father from St. Croix and a mother from Denmark, we're thinking, well, they're not African-American. They have their own cultural identity. Um, and they might, because of growing up in America, have cultural markers that align with the African-American community, but we're not necessarily seeing them as African-American. And... I think for Nella Larson, there was sort of a struggle to be absorbed, but the only option really was at that point was to be absorbed into the African-American community. Now, interestingly enough, Nella ran into trouble because she married a black upper middle class man of the bourgeois in Harlem. And the, um, the class aesthetics of the bougie literati in Harlem was not fucking with Nella because she came from what was considered a lower class background, growing up with working class parents in Chicago. Um, and she actually at first attended Fisk University. And I wonder, cause you know, when you read her biography, it doesn't really talk about what languages she spoke. And I imagine with a Danish mother that she also spoke Danish. And I wonder what her accent sounded like growing up at the turn of the, of the 19th century uh, in Southside Chicago with a Danish mom and a West Indian father. Like, I really do wonder what she sounded like phonetically. Um, because I think a lot of what, what kind of gives away from her biography is that a lot of her experiences in trying to become a part of like the black middle class at that time that was heavily in the race, like heavily into race talk, heavily into what is the representation of blackness? What does it mean to be black? How should you perform your blackness? You know, there was a W.E.B. Du Bois school of thought. There was the Booker T. Washington school of thought. Um, and she went to Fisk, which is Booker very much so. Well, not very much so because yeah, whatever. Not to, I don't need to get into the history of all this shit, but you know, she went to Fisk, and I think she early in that era ran into the Booker T. Washington School of Thought, which she did not agree with, and so she left. Then she moved to Harlem, where she was frequenting the circles of Black intellectuals like Lexi Hughes and Du Bois. But, you know, we, we can love our Black icons and also um, know that they were classes. And then Nella Larson's biography kind of confirms that. And she has several short novellas novels quicksand which has definitely seen a resurgence in the 21st century um and the book we've read passing now i personally it's it's interesting because in the newest edition of passing um the newest edition of passing 
it has an introduction from Britt Bennett who wrote The Vanishing Half. And it's very obvious for those of us that have, pre that have previously read Passing that The Vanishing Half was influenced by Passing. But I personally, for someone who hasn't read in a long time, who's interested in getting a reading, into reading, I would tell them to read The Vanishing Half first and then read Passing. Because that style of writing that comes out of like the 1920s through 60s, I think it's a little bit more difficult for people to, to commit to um, in 2021. And I think Britt Bennett kind of eases you into that so that when you get to Nella Larson's Passing, which is such an amazing book, that you can stick to reading it and really stick to seeing the story through because you understand some of the markers in a more contemporary sense. Because I do think the way Nella Larson writes, it, it, it expects you to have your own sort of culture, like, you know, the cultural markers, you already in with it, you, you know, you hear with it. And I think because of the time period that is set in for someone who doesn't read a lot, who isn't really into history, it might just take a little bit longer to get into this book. So I would definitely recommend reading Britt Bennett's The Vanishing Half first and get your soap opera in. Okay, what examples of Black literati would have shunned her? Um, in her biography, what was I reading the other day? Something I found on Jay's tour. Um, they were saying because her husband, oh, her husband cheated on her with a white woman, first of all. Her husband, that's why she let him. But her husband, like, she was having an issue because she was not college educated. And these are people that not only, nor was she in, like, Black Greek letter organization. You know, these are people that were, like, early founders. They weren't founders, but early members of the Divine Nine. And they had gone to HBCUs and they just had a, a working knowledge, you know, sort of like the way people perform blackness now, like the bougie black folk. Um, and I don't think she, I don't know. I don't know. Cause it's not a lot in a biography to gather from, but I wonder, did she care to try to meet that? Um, especially when you're meeting it at the expense of people not being interested in the cultural things that you know you grew up with mm -hmm. all right somebody says they love michelle saying she loved the movie the acting was amazing and there was a lot left to interpretation that left me wanting more i think actually the book also leaves a lot to interpretation so you know let's get into this keep remember to keep commenting along Get with it, stay with it. All right, and donate. Yeah, hit that go for me. Okay, let's get into the questions or the discussion for the book. So when the book opens, somebody says, I wanted the name of a black writer that would have shunned her. Ralph Ellison. I don't know who was like, who was the black literati at the time? Langston Hughes. Um, Ernest Gaines, you know? Like, I don't know that there was any name. There wasn't any naming of names. It was just that she was in community with these people because of who her husband was and was not, did not write during that time period, did not get her work published during that time period and wasn't found to get much support from the circles and then she abruptly left. Um, anywho, so so we start in part one with the encounter, which I thought was fascinating. We start with Irene Redfield contemplating about opening a letter from her old friend, Claire Bellaway. And this is where we get the background of like them being very light-skinned women who could pass for white. Um, Irene kind of does it in an ad need be way, but I also feel like passing is a commentary on classism as well, in that Irene is part of the bourgeois of Harlem, and they all turn their nose up at this concept of passing, but they also use this proximity to a white phenotype to their benefit. Um, and so Irene is in Chicago, she's hot, she's trying to find a toy for her son, and you know she just hops into the cab. What an identifiably black woman would not have been able to do in the 1920s Chicago. Um, and then ends up in a hotel where she runs into her old friend, Claire, who is now passing for white. 
Um, so the, the first question the syllabus asked, based upon your understanding of the title, the introduction, and about the book being about the act of racial passing, why might passing lead Claire to experience what she describes here? You know, you can't know how in this pale life of mine, I am all the time seeing the bright pictures of that other that I once thought was glad to be free of. It's like an ache, a pain that never ceases. You can't know how in this pale life of mine, I am all the time seeing the bright pictures of that other that I once thought I was glad to be free of. It's like an ache, a pain that never ceases. Hmm. Hmm. Why might passing as someone other than oneself create an ache that never ceases? You know, I think the book does a really good job through the Claire character of, exp of expressing the sort of sacrifice it takes for someone to pass over to the other side. Now, Claire clearly skirts the danger and to her own demise, definitely kind of does a lot more than the average person would have done with regards to passing because she has an aching, uh, a desire to still be around Negroes. And we get like this sort of similar character in The Vanishing Half with Britt Bennett in that the twin who decides to pass you know, can't have black friends. Like they all have this fear that if they engage with other black people, that these black people will figure them out because black people can always tell. I think we lean a little too much into that I always can tell because y'all be trying to give everybody tickets to the barbecue and even got the girl heated up. Stop it. But, um, you know, end up having, and then Claire and just like the characters in The Vanishing Half end up having to be like even more racist to draw that line in the sand between them and black folk because they don't want to be found out. And then so she's left with this aching because she, this huge part of herself that she grew up with as a child, having to cut that off isn't compensated by the lavish lifestyle she's now living. Hmm. Do you think people are still passing today? Reflecting on Irene's depiction of Claire's childhood and sighting during her adulthood, how has Claire benefited from passing? And Claire, both Claire, I don't know if it was very clear in the book about like which of Claire and Irene's parents were light skinned. <laughs> I do think it's true. Folks now, you know, being black is profitable. So now people are passing for black. Um, yeah, does the book make it clear about like how they ended up with their phenotype? I, I think for Claire, because we get more of her like story about going to live with her aunts who turned out to be very white. Um, and they didn't want to let anybody know that that child was not white because it would mess their flow up, but they were very mean to her and had her do all the cooking and cleaning. Um, but that also that sort of their own derision about acknowledging um Claire's ethnic makeup also meant that like she could move into whiteness a little bit easier through this tragedy um yeah it's a way it, it's not shaped as though Claire I don't think we ever get the sense that Claire is ashamed of her black identity but more or less that she had an opportunity to get out of poverty and that to get out of poverty meant passing into another ethnic group and she took it and now here she is, a little sad, a little sad. What role does socioeconomic status and colorism seem to play in the lives of both Irene and Claire? How does this status provide an opportunity to connect that would not be possible if Irene, for example, were poor or working class? And I think that is very clear in the writing of the book that sort of this Rini <laughs> attachment Claire has is that her friend also married up and can be in the Drayton Hotel with her, can be at high life parties with her, can do fancy things just with Black people 
And I wonder if Claire didn't think that was a possibility for herself as a child. You know? They not think of the possibilities of, you know, marrying into high society with amongst black folk. But it doesn't seem like either of them are comfortable in their status. You know, like I when we get into the interior of Irene's marriage to Brian, it, it seems like she's very much so overcompensating for a husband that is not content in the least bit. Um, it is cr interesting, though, how we have morphed into the 21st century where the social currency lies with being seen as Black versus in this setting in the 1920s, being seen as white could change your whole life. All right, let's get in. We're going to move a little quickly. Let's get into the scene where in chapter three, I believe, so Claire and so Irene ends up um is it at Claire's yeah at Claire's home where they have another friend who is also um passing as white though her white husband knows of her ethnic makeup knows that she's black but is called, but like to the outer society they just pass for white to make it easier um and they are all at Claire's house. Um, and then John, Claire's husband, shows up. And that's how we learn about um, Claire's nickname, Nig, which is, ooh, what a mess. Huh. And so when we get outside of the Bellu's home after the whole scene, I mean, I think that that scene is really kind of a transition in the story as a whole in that uh, we get this brief like connection, a little awkward of Irene and Claire at the Drayton Hotel. And then we very quickly move to their their home or their hotel where we then encounter her husband and we realize how deep in the shits Claire really is that she is married to a man who very much so broadly hates black people. And she participates in that hatred and in that racism um, in order to keep up appearances with her husband, but then plays with fire by having her two light bright homegirls over um, who are who have the option of passing for white, though they are not as far in to the racial passing as Claire is and engage her husband who is just going on and on about the, the, the Negroes. Um, when they leave the house, Gertrude and Irene, who are clearly both uncomfortable, they discuss how they imagine that Irene, um, Claire is still pretty safe, that they don't live here, you know, and there's a child, there's a certain security. Somehow, I don't know, if a person hates black folks that much and he find out he had a child with a, a, a what he defines as a black woman, mm, I don't know. We had a whole period of slavery where white plantation owners were definitely producing children and enslaving them. I, You know what I mean? I don't trust the white man's heart, okay? Yes, I agree. The division of class and how Irene treated her maid, Zerlina. I think Zerlina is such a pretty name, Zerlina. And even that, like, that whole, that whole discussion about having a dark child and then the description of Zerlina in contrast to how Theo Jr. and Brian are described, like, there is a hierarchy of skin complexion happening here and somehow you're like ugh, how dare you be how dare you be passing into whiteness but also like ugh, the dog skins like 
Okay. Is Gertrude better off than Claire since her husband Martin knows of her race? We get Gertrude very, very, very briefly. Bruh. <laughs> You know what? I imagine Claire looks like Doja Cat. I don't know why. Oh, um, <laughs> but that <laughs> maybe some of you know why the, the nig reminds me of Doja Cat too. But um, yeah. How do you think that nickname impacts Claire? Like, does it make her even more scared of the reveal of the possibilities of harm that can come her way because of her husband's personal beliefs about black people and her own racial passing. Hmm. Um, yeah. Get it to it. Yeah, I definitely agree that Gertrude is much safer because not only does her husband know, his family knows. And it's just like, it's just something they don't talk about because when you're surrounded by that much whiteness and they all accept you, they're like, who has to go out that way to prove anything? Okay. So in part two, we, we're back in Harlem. We get the interior life of Irene who is holding on barely. Um, and Irene, when she's talking to Brian about Claire, says it's funny about passing. We disapprove of it and at the same time condone it. It excites our contempt and yet we rather admire it. We shy away from it with an odd kind of revulsion, but we protect it. Brian responds that it is an instinct of the race to survive and expand. What are our thoughts on passing being a means of survival and expansion? How has this rhetoric been used to justify things like eugenics about the survival of the fittest? We get very ableist very quickly with that sort of language. Oh man, that whole little conversation her and Brian have about sex and junior. And, oh. And just the way I can't, I just, I can't imagine being a woman in that time period and having to think about fitting into all these social mores and having to like hold everything together. Girl, speak your mind. <laughs> She's always strategizing in the car, right? Uh, and can't say what she wants. She has to hold off because she needs to keep the peace in her marriage. I don't see how passing would lead to survival for Black people. It's erasure. I don't think passing is about a collective survival. I think passing is a choice about an individual doing what they can do in very limited circumstances. I don't think passing has anything to do with the collective. Irene and Claire attend the Negro Welfare League dance. Larson's descriptions highlight the crowd's diversity, not just of race and skin color, but also of age and size. We are also introduced to Hugh, who describes trying to figure out the race of Claire. Why are these descriptions important? Yeah, I agree that Irene tries to absolve her own issues with her proximity to Blackness by joining these social communities and clubs. Um, you know, I think I'll, I definitely think it's interesting that the movie for such a short book took a good bit out, right? So what's in the movie, the whole movie is set in Harlem, right? We, we, we don't have any time period where we're in Chicago. And it honestly feels like a weekend. The movie is kind of set in a very brief period over a weekend. So we don't get this length of time where like Irene is avoiding responding to Claire's letter, but yet they're both yearning and Irene and Claire just randomly shows up at Irene's house unannounced. And then they have that whole interaction about the the Negro Welfare League dance. Yeah, we don't have the, the white patron 
who spots Claire and is like, hmm, where are you from? I mean, don't know we do. We, we kind of, it kind of all gets lumped into that dance scene at the very end. Well, like the, you know, the house party scene. Um, yeah. Huh. But I think it was, it gets left out of the book because everything gets condensed into a weekend. The movie had a problem with time. That's one thing that bothered me about the movie. Yeah, it didn't, it didn't establish time periods or days gone by or like movement of time. It all kind of felt very static. Um, there's quite, there's some really good questions in the syllabus about Hugh and what he represents about larger American society overtaken by the completion of difference and chaos and confusion. What can Hugh teach us about the complexities of race and standards of beauty? Everybody is enamored, enamored of this Claire's beauty. Oh, am I tired? Oh, I am. Do you in this book think that Irene and Claire are attracted to each other? Mm. Is there a sexual tension between the two of them? Um, because as we get into the, the later half of the book, right? We then get into, it feels like Irene judges uh, Claire's lack of parenting for her own daughter, Marjorie. Um, but Irene is also fascinated with what she perceives as Claire's autonomy. And we get so many references to Claire's beauty. So there's this very much so sort of often on Irene's part notation about how attractive Claire is. Um, how might Irene's judgment actually be a demonstration of envy? And does Claire really have autonomy? And is it because of her passing white? I think, either, you know, at the beginning of the book, they just kind of describe Claire as a person who looks like, literally doesn't think of anybody but herself. And so why wouldn't that show up in her motherhood? Is, is, is it really autonomy or is it just what Claire takes? It's just the risk she takes. It's the way she lives her life. It's just what she does. And I mean, I guess on one, on one sense, yeah, that whiteness does allow that to happen without repercussion because it's, oh, I'm sending my child away to boarding school in Switzerland. Oh, we're sending the child off here. So yeah, she doesn't have to feel like there's not this, you're a bad mother. Oh no, my child's at school in Switzerland. Sounds very responsible, yeah? I think they were infatuated with each other, maybe. They're fascinated with each other. <laughs> a lot of fascinations. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not feeling no heavy, <laughs> heavy sexual tension in this book. All right, so when we get into part three, this, this, this section describes varying forms of sexual urgency and fascination assumed to be shared by Brian, despised by Hugh because of Claire's lack of energy toward him, and kindled by Irene. Reflecting on the social milieu, milieu of the 1920s Harlem, how are Larson's depictions of race and sexuality significant? I was very, I was very shocked, you know, first reading that Larson would even bring these things up so poignantly. Even in the discussion that um, Rini and Brian had about their son, Junior, and, you know, him becoming a boy to a man and being at that middle school age and, you know, learning about sex and Brian being like, Ugh, Get your panties out of a bunch, Rini. Uh, and it's interesting because Irene and Brian have a relationship that's very much so lacking intimacy. 
Um, and we dig even deeper into Irene's fascination with Claire and her beauty. So there are theories that Irene's lack of intimacy with Brian and fascination with Claire uh, have been depicted as Irene's sexual or at least aesthetic attraction to Claire. Going back to the sex topic, there was a hint of sexual attraction to Claire from Irene. Maybe it was me reading into it. I think the attraction is very much so mutual. I think both of them are in relationships that are not fulfilling their needs, but it's like, um, what is it called? Forced heterosexuality. Like they, do they know that there are other possibilities? Do they know that they have other options? Um, you know, but they are informed that they have to do like their own safety, their own well being is to partner heterosexually. Then you end up in these relationships where you cannot be yourself. Cause like, even within her relationship, Claire is biting her time, right? It's like, okay, your husband wants to go to Brazil. You didn't want to go to Brazil. We get it. It's 1920s. Like, I don't think it's unrealistic, but like, you also have to manage that you kind of clipped his wings and there needs to be other discussions about that. But somehow like it has to be so well managed and so prompted this specific way. It has to be so planned out and has to be so strategic. And this is the person that you're married and having children with and you can't talk to them. Yeah. How might Claire and Irene's marriages exist only as a facade of security? I think that's a very true point that Claire had no one to mother her. So her life seemed about survival. I think she very much so took on the belief that like, if she don't get it for herself, nobody will. Oh, I'm so sorry. You couldn't find the link on Facebook. It doesn't just show up in the feed when you come to the group. Facebook is so wonky and nobody gets back to my emails. Like I've been emailing about so many things at the book club and... It's very frustrating. But you, if you go to the um, Facebook group, you should be able to just, it should be the top post. Ooh, don't forget, we're running a sale for my birthday. Three GRWN7, 20% off everything. Get into it. When you're in the Facebook group, it doesn't show up. Huh, that's so crazy. Let me check on my phone. I don't know. It's not like we can move to another platform. Ain't nobody downloading new apps. You can come over to Discord, but I feel like people are having a hard time with Discord too. Yeah, it's right here at the top. Hmm. Mm hmm. Okay, in chapter three, John learns of Irene's true racial background, which, al which also teaches him about his wife as well. This happens when Felice and Irene are seen by John walking down a public street. Later, Irene is seen struggling with her loyalty to Claire. She provides her with a space in her life and also fails to protect Claire by informing her of her run in with John. Irene seems to question Claire's intentions and the threat that she possesses to her security. Why do you think Irene struggles with her relationship with Claire? Man, that's rough. That essentially Irene ends up giving away Claire's identity because she's with another black woman from her same social class. And she can't be like, hurry up, act like my maid. She can't play it off. And so she gets got. And John's like, I had a, a Negro in my house. I don't know why Claire couldn't just be like, I was passing. She didn't know. I'm sorry. Or I don't, like, I don't know. This is my secretary. <laughs> and 
and then she chooses not to tell Claire that she that John saw her out. So now Claire can't even fill in the story. You think Claire was trying to steal Irene's life? I think in the movie it's really weird because we don't we obviously we don't get this good we don't get this good understanding of the time that's passed, right? But it, I felt like the movie almost portrayed it as though Brian was intrigued by Claire, like he was turned on. Like he wanted he wanted to get in the bits. I thought too that the severe needs to be proper in language, dress code, etc. But everyone in the book was extremely messy. <laughs> oh, absolutely! By not telling her, she does kind of set her up. It's like a, it's like you know she she's jealous of all the autonomy that Claire has that she withholds autonomy. Woo! You know, it it was it was a mess, and I, I, it's kind of sad because this is the part that I wanted the movie to really dig into, but I think because they took out other essential parts that it doesn't come full circle the same way the book does. Well, not that the book comes full circle because the book does kind of leave you with the cliffhanger, like did it did that happen or did that not happen? Is that what I thought happened or did that not happen? Okay, y'all are saying y'all think y'all think Claire wanted Irene's life. But does Irene even want Irene's life? I think there was like a, a like a green eye. Didn't they already have green eyes? Oh man, was this Robin and Giselle? Uh, but they I think there was like a mutual desire for what the other had, right? Um, that daring, that risk taking. I think Irene definitely wish she had, but Uh, I don't know. We play, we play. Mm. Mm -hmm. Irene wants to be Claire and resents her for having a fuck you attitude claire is who irene wants to be okay shout out to whoever just signed up to be an insider i need everybody who's an insider to sign back up forgot to shout that out um yeah at the end of the book i think we kind of get a really good understanding of irene's controlling ways and how that controlling that desire to control hasn't really panned out the way irene has hoped it would um so what has her history of controlling things given Irene even? Uh, is it providing her with the security that she desires? And then we can talk about the ending. Because I want to know what y'all thought happened at the end of the story. Like, who, 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 was it a jumping? Who pushed? Was it an accident? And do you, did you care for the ending? Did you think it provided a certain utility for the author to end the book the way they did? What was your interpretation of the ending? Could it be that Irene saw Claire's at risk taking as freedom? Oh, I absolutely, I absolutely think that is the case. Absolutely. Huh. Irene killed her. Claire was creating. Oh, y'all think Irene was that violent? Oh. Oh, you really think so?
Could it be that Irene saw Claire's risk taking his freedom? We already answered that, yeah. Yes, they both wanted to see just how green the grass was on the other side, but couldn't admit it to themselves or to each other. Yeah, they there was a lot of things left unsaid. There was a lot you had to kind of like read between the lines. I don't think she was angry when she did it, but I think she felt pushed into a corner to do it. Her nerves are just all jacked up regarding Claire. Isn't it still kind of devilish? No? That like, that her thought is, oh, the thing I should do to this person to resolve the issue. Irene may not have pushed her, but she didn't try to help her. I mean, I guess it's just as bad, huh? I'm not sure what Irene wanted. I just know she didn't want Claire to have what she had. You think it was getting that close? Hmm. Hmm. That close. Huh. It's, it's such a shame, though, because I feel like this ending came because they did not, like, they couldn't be vulnerable. I mean, granted, Claire was who she was. Irene was who she was. But, like, you know, nobody's perfect. But it's just like, damn. Like, I Claire couldn't just run away? <laughs> Start life anew? I don't know. Like, how did the world become that small and that cramped? Claire's death allows Irene to continue to hide as or pass for being a good person. So I guess the consensus is that we all think that Irene was in her own capacity, not racially passing, but that she was also passing or hiding herself or presenting herself as someone who she was not in, a, in another way. Definitely something to ruminate on. Um, I would love to hear more thoughts on this. Please feel free to comment along. You can comment down um, in the comment section of the video on Facebook or YouTube or Twitter. Get with it. Thank y'all for joining. Thank you for get, getting into this discussion with us. We are reading Bad Fat Black Girl for the month of April. Um, and thank you for supporting the SBG Book Club. I will see y'all on the other Sigh, we're going to close out here. Have a great night.